have time for our monthly what is written study. I hope to address three or four questions this morning as time allows, and so we'll get right to our first question. I happen to know that this is a question that someone asked one of the members here. Christ himself did asceticism when he went to the desert and fasted for 40 days. How could asceticism be a false teaching if the Lord did it? Well, I think we need to begin by defining our terms. The American Heritage Dictionary says that the word asceticism means the principles and practices of an ascetic, extreme self-denial and austerity. The doctrine that the ascetic life releases, releases the soul from bondage to the body and permits union with the divine. It seems to me that the operative term in that definition is extreme self-denial and austerity. I know that you understand that the New Testament teaches um, self-denial and self-control. The dictionary defines the word ascetic like this, practicing strict self-denial as a measure of personal and especially spiritual discipline, austere in appearance, manner, or attitude. Um, a person who renounces material comforts and leads a life of austere self-discipline. Again, the operative words are strict and austere. And so what about Jesus and asceticism? The questioner asserted that Jesus was ascetic and the questioner was alluding to Jesus being led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil after his baptism. Well, it's important to understand that Jesus did this because he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And let me remind you that during that 40-day period, Jesus fasted, but his fasting was limited to that 40-day period. There is an abundant evidence in the New Testament that Jesus was not an ascetic in, in the sense in which this term is normally understood. He mixed and mingled with other people. For example, in Matthew chapter 11, on one occasion Jesus was asked, why the disciples of the Pharisees and John's disciples fasted, but his disciples did not. Matthew writes in Matthew eleven eighteen 18 and 19, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. Oh, I was alluding to a different passage. Excuse me. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine-bibber a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is justified by her children. I think that's a clear indication that Jesus mixed and mingled with other people. He did not practice some kind of uh, strict asceticism. Uh, he taught the multitudes and they were amazed at his teaching. Um, Jesus sent his disciples out into the world to teach um, and heal. Now, the points that I'm making here also would relate to the practice of monasticism in the Middle Ages, where monks would cloister themselves inside the four walls of a monastery and have very little uh, contact with the world. I, I don't remember the fellow's name, but I remember reading about a fellow that went up on top of a pole and he just lived on top of this pole for uh, extended periods of time. Well, Jesus sent his disciples out into the world 
on the limited commission that we read about in Matthew 10. He sends the 70 out uh, to teach in Luke chapter 10. And then, of course, there's the great commission uh, given in Matthew and Mark. In what has been commonly called Jesus' high priestly prayer, the prayer that's recorded for us in John chapter 17, let me remind you that Jesus prayed not that the Father would take his disciples out of the world, but that he would keep them from becoming a part of the world. Look at John 17, verse 14 and 15. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And then down in verse 18, Jesus says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. The world. Again, this relates primarily to the practice of monasticism um, in the Middle Ages. Uh, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be insulated from the world, not isolated from the world. It's true that Jesus taught self denial. But he did not teach denying yourself things necessarily. Now there is one exception that I can think of, and that is the exception of the rich young ruler. Jesus did tell him to sell all of his possessions, give them the, to the poor, take up his cross and follow Jesus. But Jesus did not routinely give that same instruction to other people. Why did he tell the rich young ruler to do that? Well, I think you already know. You know that that man's gold was more important to him than his God. And that's why Jesus gave him that instruction. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, taught that asceticism is of no value. In Colossians chapter 2, notice what he says beginning in verse 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. Well, those were ascetic practices. Notice Paul's asking, why are you submitting to those kinds of things? He says, verse 26, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Notice, he equates, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. He says those are the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So Paul clearly tells us that these man-made ascetic practices have no spiritual value. And when Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he mentions the fact that in the future there would be those who would depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, 
speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I know that you're aware of the fact that the Catholic Church requires celibacy on the part of its clergy, priests, and nuns. And there was a time when they forbid the eating of meat on Fridays. In fact, when I was in an elementary school, I remember that they always served fish on Fridays. But you may also recall that that's been changed uh, since then. When you look into the New Testament, you read of both wealthy and poor uh, disciples. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea uh, were evidently wealthy men, Joseph certainly. Barnabas owned property, which suggests that he had some financial wherewithal. Mary had a house large enough to accommodate several Christians gathering together to pray. Lydia was a seller of purple, a businesswoman who had a house and she invited Paul and his companions to stay with her while they were in Philippi. Again, an indication of some measure of wealth. But then, of course, we read about the poor widow with the two mites. There were times when, when Paul uh, was very poor. We read about the poor saints in Jerusalem. Uh, James talks about uh, the fact that Christians should not show partiality favoring the rich over a poor man who might come into their assembly uh, in ragged clothing. So I hope that this information will be helpful uh, in responding to this question. Well, here's our second question. What advice would you offer a one-talent Christian? to avoid the belief that he is not as worthwhile or profitable in the Lord's work. Do you have any suggestions on how a Christian can avoid comparing his talents to others? Well, I think that's a thoughtful question. I think I would begin by pointing out that in the parable of the sower, when Jesus talks about the good ground, he says that it brought forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. Jesus understood that good ground would produce different amount of grain, but it was still good ground, pleasing to the Lord. In the parable of the talents, we need to remember that a talent was a measure of money. It wasn't what we normally think of as talents. When we talk about someone uh, having talents, we're talking about his abilities, his skills. That's not what this word is talking about. It's a measure of money. But notice that the master in the parable distributed his talents according to his ability, according to the ability of his servants. And so the servant with more ability, he gave five talents. A servant with a little less, he gave two. And then finally there was that one talent man. But please note that the reward that were given the faithful servants were, was the same. In Matthew chapter 25, look with me at verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. 
Then the next verse says, He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two, two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The approval that the master showed the five-talent man is the same as the approval that he showed to the two-talent man. And presumably, if the one-talent man had used his talents rather than burying them in the ground, he, the master would have been pleased with him in the same way. Let me remind you that Jesus tells us that someone who would offer a cup of cold water in his name would be rewarded. Now, would you think that giving someone a cup of cold water is some great uh, magnanimous thing that someone does in the kingdom? Well, I think not. But Jesus is telling us someone who does that is not going to lose his reward. The Lord notices those little acts of service and kindness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul compares the church with the human body, he makes the point that the body, the human body, is made up of many different members. And they don't all have the same function. We understand that. Our eyes see. Our ears hear. Our feet walk. Our hands do various tasks. They don't all do the same things. And yet, they're all needed. In fact, I'm not taking the time to read this passage, but I would encourage you to do that. Paul asserts that the, the lesser members of the body are given more honor. I think in the context, he's alluding to those private parts of the body uh, that are involved in procreation and reproduction and things like that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and in verse 12, Paul says, for if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. I think Paul is telling us that God does not expect us to do something that we can't do. And we need to remember that when we think about our abilities and things like that. It is certainly the case that God expects us to grow and develop our talents. But practically speaking, there's likely going to be some limitation in that. As much as I would have liked to have been able to dunk a basketball when I was younger, I just didn't have the ability to do that unless I lowered the goal. <laughs> and I did that, <laughs> and that was fun. <laughs> I just don't have that ability. And that was something that I just had to learn to accept. So as far as some advice, I would... I would say, begin by believing what God says about this. In other words, believe everything that we've just talked about. Accept that. We don't all have the same abilities. That is just a fact of life. There are fellows that preach better than I do. 
That's just something I have to accept. God doesn't expect me to preach like Paul Earnhardt or Dee Bowman. He expects me to preach like Kevin Kay can preach. So we have to accept the fact that some have more talent and abilities than others. But Christ wants us to use the talents that we do have. We mustn't allow ourselves to bemoan the fact that maybe we don't have the talent to do what some other Christians can do, and so we just kind of sit there and, and fail to use the abilities that God gives us. That's not going to be pleasing to Christ. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, beginning in verse 3, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has, has dealt with each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, notice what Paul says next, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Christ does expect us to use the talents that we have. He also expects us to try to develop new talents. Again, there may be some limitation in that. But we do need to try to improve and develop our talents. Well, we must hurry along. I have heard people say that Moses could not have written Deuteronomy, at least the end of the book, because he couldn't have documented his own death in chapter 34. However, Moses was a prophet, so could he not have prophesied his own death and thus documented, thus documented it himself. Well, before I address this specific question, let me remind you that there is just abundant evidence that the law, the Old Testament law, is associated uh, with Moses repeatedly in many different ways. We read about things being written in the book of the law of Moses, in the law of Moses, the law in the book of Moses, the book of Moses, the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses. The Apologetic Study Bible asserts ancient Jewish and Christian tradition is unanimous in attributing Deuteronomy to Moses. The book itself makes this claim as does the rest of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the writings of the Jewish rabbis. Well, it is correct that ancient Jewish and Christian tradition unanimously attribute Deuteronomy to Moses. But a lot of what this book says and the rest of this quotation, I think, is a bit of an overstatement this writer, I think, is more accurate when he says the book of Deuteronomy claims to preserve the words which Moses spake. While no specific claim is made that Moses himself recorded all these words, there are references in the book to the writing of this law by Moses. Substantial parts of Deuteronomy would therefore seem to be attributed to him as author. I think that is a more accurate assessment of the evidence. The contents of Deuteronomy is dependent upon what Moses spoke. 
what he commanded, what he explained, what he taught, what he set before Israel, what he said, notice you've got a few references to what he wrote. And we read about Moses pronouncing a blessing. The Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, are attributed to Moses. And there are certain things that are expressly said to have been written by Moses. He was to write a memorial concerning Amalek. He was to write all the words of the Lord. He wrote the book of the covenant. He wrote a record of Israel's journeys from Egypt to the promised land. He was to write the words of this law. He wrote the song of Moses and taught it to Israel. We just recently looked at that in our Wednesday night class. Um, he is said perhaps to have written the law of Moses. There is a question in Joshua 8.32 whether Joshua is being referred to or Moses. The chronicler says that the law, the statutes, and the ordinances were by the hand of Moses. Now, I think that's rather significant. Uh, and then we read about Moses being read, so we know that there were things that Moses wrote. The New Testament refers to certain things that Moses wrote. Jesus alluded to the burning bush passage that was in the book of Moses. Of course, that's Exodus chapter 3. Well, that's found, according to Jesus, in the book of Moses. Uh, John records the Lord talking about Moses, writing about him. Well, what does that mean? It means Moses wrote messianic prophecies about Jesus. Well, what might they have been? Well, the reference in Genesis 3.15 to the enmity between Satan and the woman's seed. Uh, you will bruise his heel, he will bruise your head. I'm paraphrasing there. Uh, God promised Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed through him and through his seed. Um, when Jacob blessed his sons, he said the scepter would not depart from Judah till Shiloh come. Uh, none of the bones of the Passover lamb were to be broken. And uh, John says that that was uh, a fulfillment of prophecy in the fact that Jesus' bones were not broken. Um, Jesus said that just as the serpent was uh, put on the pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man would be lifted up. Um, Balaam prophesied that there would be a star coming out of Jacob. Moses said that God would raise up a prophet like him. And Peter tells us in Acts 3 that this had its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. So you've got statements like that that talk about prophecies evidently written by Moses. <clears throat> well, Moses was certainly a prophet. <laughs> uh, as I just said, he said that God would raise up a prophet like me. Hosea uh, identified Moses as a prophet. And so, as a prophet, he could have prophesied his own death. But the question is, did he do that? It's not enough to argue, well, because he was a prophet, he could have prophesied 
his own death. The question is, is that what he was doing in Deuteronomy chapter 34? Well, I don't really think that's what's going on. Because Deuteronomy 34 reads like a narrative, not a prophecy. And so it seems to me that Deuteronomy 34 was probably added by someone else, perhaps Joshua. To me, that seems to be the best explanation of the material in the last chapter. Now, that doesn't mean that Moses didn't write Deuteronomy uh, in the main. There are also, evidently, certain editorial updates in various places in the books of the Torah. For example, in Genesis chapter 14, verse 14, we read about a city called Dan in northern Israel, but that city wasn't established until the conquest. Uh, and we have reference, references to that in the book of Judges as well. Uh, in Genesis 36, we read about there being kings in Edom before there were kings in Israel. Well, Moses died before there were any kings in Israel. Someone must have added that information. I've read commentators who argued that Moses would not have written the fact that he was a very humble man. I I don't know if that's the case or not, uh, but some have argued that. But look look quickly at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 12. The Horites formerly dwelt in Seir, but the descendants of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their place. Now notice this last phrase. Just as Israel did to the land of their possession, which the Lord gave them. Well, Israel hadn't gone in and possessed the land. When when Moses is delivering these addresses... But here's a reference to something that happened after they went into the land. So I think this, and there there are other statements like this. Uh, It seems to me these must be editorial updates that were added later on. Several times in the book of Deuteronomy, and you certainly see that a lot in the book of Joshua, There's reference uh, to something being the case to this day, suggesting that there's been some elapse of time from um, the event being described and the written record concerning that. Okay, I'm out of time, uh, but I hope that this has been helpful. Thank you.